Um, we do that primarily for large enterprises, so think Fortune 1000, uh, basically companies that have big environments, hundreds of locations, thousands or tens of thousands of devices involved with their projects. Uh, so we do a lot of work for banking, retail, government, uh, hospital groups, those types of environments. We like to say that we work from core to edge, so we do a lot of networking. Uh, we're Cisco Gold Partners, so we do a lot of working in, in the network space. Uh, we do a lot of workplace technology projects, a lot of collaboration projects, and over the last few years we've been doing more and more projects that involve IoT technologies. So the theme for the session today is achieving speed and agility in the Internet of Everything, which doesn't that sound lovely, right? So uh, I got a spoiler alert for you. I do not have a magic solution that's going to make that possible today. We don't have some product that magically makes that possible. Uh, instead, what we're going to do is try to deconstruct IoT projects a little bit, think about the pieces of how they're put together, uh, and help you know, sort of find some, some tips and some tricks that we can use uh, to help make us a little bit faster, a little bit more agile uh, as we approach IoT projects. So start, starting with a quick quote, um, I'm an engineer by education, and when I was in engineering school, I had a professor introduce me to this quote, uh, and it really stuck with me. So uh, it's from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's a famous uh, Supreme Court justice in the early 1900s, and he says, for the simplicity that lies on this side of complexity, I would not give a fig. I guess they used a different F word in the early 1900s. Uh, but for the simplicity that lies on the other side of complexity, I would give my life. And that quote stuck with me because it, to me it's sort of the essence of engineering. You're taking complicated problems, complicated scenarios, and trying to distill it down to something simple, an elegant solution to that. Uh, very rarely do you defeat complexity with more complexity. A uh, good example of that is the U uh, United States tax code. Uh, we just keep adding more and more rules onto it, and it gets more and more complicated and never gets any better. Uh, so when we approach IoT projects, there's lots of complexity. And the best way to deal with that complexity is to try to simplify things as much as we can. Now, quick question. Who, who anyone in here have active IoT projects going on in their organization today? Awesome. So, People that have those going on, is the word simple something that would quickly come to mind in terms of how you describe those projects? Typically not. So uh, what we'll try to do today is, is work through some of that complexity, try to come up with some simple frameworks, some things that you can take back with you um, that again won't solve the puzzle for you, won't make this, you know, all of a sudden have a panacea and have it be easy, but will hopefully make it a little bit easier as you work your way through those projects. So, so why do we even care, right? So what, what, uh, why is it important to try to uh, tackle all the complexity associated with IoT projects? Uh, well, first of all, we, we don't really have a choice. Um, I think every presentation that ever happens at any conference around IoT is required to have a slide like this one that basically says more connected devices. And everybody says by the year 2020, we'll have some number of billion of connected devices, whether it's 20 billion, 30 billion, 50 billion. The one I have here is uh, from Cisco. Cisco projects that by 2020 we'll have 50 billion connected devices. The world population will be increasing to about 7.6 billion. So we'll have, on average, over six and a half connected devices per person on the Earth. So we're going to work in this environment. We are not going to be able to avoid this complexity. So we really don't have a choice. So that, that's the, the, we just have to deal with it answer to that question of why we care. The positive is there's also a, a good side to it in, in that there's a ton of opportunity. Uh, if we can deal with this complexity, um, Cisco projects that in the internet of everything space, and, who, and I'm sure everyone's heard the term IoT. Has everybody heard the term internet of everything? Okay, so just to quickly define that uh, for folks. so. Internet of Things, connecting things in and of itself doesn't unlock anything amazing or valuable. Uh, if I put sensors on a toothbrush, I have a connected toothbrush. What does that really do? Nothing. Uh, it's when you take the data that comes from having connected things and you're able to integrate that with smart processes and have people interacting with those processes and using that data in ways to take actions with the things. 
that's the Internet of Everything, as Cisco defines it, and Cisco again projects that by 2022, there will be $14.4 trillion of new value created by that scenario um, as we get more devices connected and we start to build solutions that take advantage of that system. Uh, we create new value by either better asset utilization, better employee productivity, uh, improving customer experiences, optimizing supply chains, creating new innovation. So it's important, uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there to be captured if we can attack this complexity. The other good news is the opportunity isn't isolated to any particular industry. So virtually every major industry has potential use cases for IoT technologies that really are amazing. Uh, manufacturing, government, utilities, transportation, retail, just as some examples. Um, in manufacturing, for example, being able to monitor um, the, the vibration and the heat that's coming off your equipment on an assembly line. Assembly lines cost a lot of money when they go down. If you're able to detect a piece of equipment is falling out of spec and do maintenance on it before it breaks down and takes your line down, uh, you can save a ton of money. We, we work with uh, one customer uh, that's a chip fab facility. They lose, they calculate their downtime in millions of dollars per hour. So every hour that that facility is down, they lose millions of dollars. So everything that they can do to prevent an outage from occurring saves them millions of dollars. Uh, government, this is a picture of a smart parking meter that San Francisco is using. Uh, it basically helps people know where free parking spots are. So there's a parking meter at the parking spot. It knows whether there's a car in it or not. It sends that data up to the web and people can access that on the mobile platform. If I need to park somewhere in the city, I don't have to circle blocks over and over trying to find a free parking spot. I can see where one is available, if there's one available. Um, another really cool use case, it's sort of hard to see uh, under transportation, but uh, I'm sure everyone knows Tesla, uh, Elon Musk's uh, electric car company. Has anybody ever heard of a new Tesla feature that got announced earlier this year called Summit? Okay, so this is incredibly cool uh, new capability that actually is in Tesla software today. And what it does is you pull your phone out uh, and you're able to summon your vehicle. Now, in the early stages that it exists in today, it, it only works locally. So when I wake up in the morning, I can walk out to my driveway and I can hit the summon button and the car will pull itself out of the garage and pull up next to me and I can get in it and drive away. Or when I get home, I can hit the summon button in reverse and the car will actually put my garage door up, pull itself in the garage, put the door back down and park itself. So that in and of itself isn't that amazing. Uh, it's not that different from cars that can parallel park themselves and that type of thing. What's really amazing about it is when they announced this, uh, Elon Musk said that by 2018, so just two years from now, he projects that you'll be able to summon your Tesla vehicle from Los Angeles while you're in New York. So you can hit the summon button and the car will actually get out of your garage, drive itself across the country, stop, recharge itself when it needs to, uh, and come to your location. Or it'll sync with your calendar. So if you have a meeting here in New York City, the car will drop you off. If you drive the car to where your meeting is, you get out of it, the car will go park itself. So it knows when your meeting is over, so it'll leave the parking spot and be waiting for you at the curb when you leave the meeting. So uh, really interesting use cases in transportation. Retail, uh, that's a picture of a virtual dressing room. Uh, it's, again, a little hard to see, but the woman standing in front of it uh, is just wearing a plain white shirt. Uh, and what she's looking at is a augmented reality picture of herself. So there's a camera taking live video of her, and it's over leaving, interleaving over that video image clothes that she's selected to try on virtually. So she can move around and see you know, how those clothes look without actually having to try them on. And what you do is there's RFID tags embedded either in the tag uh, uh, or the label of the clothing that you bring over to that area. You put the clothes uh, there and you back up and you can see how you look in those clothes without having to go in a dressing room and actually try them on. So really interesting technology. So that's the good part. That's the fun part. The potential is there. The hard part is that there's so many challenges and so much complexity to actually get one of those uh, solutions designed and implemented. So just an example of the types of questions that we deal with when we try to engineer and deliver IoT solutions. 
How are we going to apply IoT technology to our business? Uh, will it move the needle? Uh, how do I know it will provide ROI? How am I going to get executive buy-in? How am I going to make it secure? What type of platform am I going to use? How will I integrate it with my existing IT assets? How am I going to maintain and service it once I deploy it? Uh, how do I get it deployed and implemented as quickly as possible? And very often, all of these questions lead to kind of the mother question of them all for a lot of our customers is just, where do I start? Like, how, how do I even begin to attack that? So our view is that it can be extremely helpful to take that monstrous IoT project and rather think of it as one large end-to-end -end project to break it into three distinct phases and approach it in very uniquely different ways at each stage. Uh, those three stages are very logical and simple, uh, really not earth shattering in terms of what they are. First, you need to identify a winning business concept, basically the killer use case for your business for how you can apply IoT technology. After you have that, you, you need to harden and operationalize it. And after you harden and operationalize it, you want to deploy it at scale as fast as possible. So, very straightforward and logical approach, but it's important to note that it's not just knowing that these phases exist, it's consciously ignoring the activities that happen in other phases as you work your way down. And each phase, you actually need dramatically different people, skills, processes, and technologies involved to be successful. And if you're trying to attack all of it at the same time, you just get, it's easy to get confused and stuck. So what we'll do for the next 15 minutes or so is go through each one of these phases, talk about some of the key challenges that exist in those phases, some tips or um, sort of best practices for how to deal with those key challenges, and then talk about this specific people, process, and technology elements that you want to think about for moving a project. And this is really a pipeline, right? So you, you have, a, and it's shaped like a funnel for a reason. You're going to try a lot of ideas at the top. A lot of them are going to die. They're never going to get any further than that. Uh, so there's no point in thinking about how you're going to harden and you know make a solution secure if it never actually is going to make it past the concept phase to begin with. So for the next 15 minutes or so, we'll go through each phase one by one, talk about um, those challenges, and also talk about some examples or we've done projects to sort of give you a flavor of how, how you can apply this in practice. So first stage, identify winning business concept. So the key challenge here is, again, find that killer use case for your business. Um, a, a, a helpful way to think about this, and this is not a universal law or anything, but in general, um, from our experience, the most impactful killer IoT use cases tend to do one of two things. They either change a customer experience, uh, so think the Tesla example, uh, where I can hit a summon button and my car will come to me wherever I am. That dramatically changes the car driving experience, right? or two, create new valuable data and insights. So think about the manufacturing example. If I have real-time sensor data on the temperature and the vibration of all the equipment on my assembly line, it allows me to do something that I couldn't do before. I can take actions and I can be smart about preventative maintenance uh, to keep my factory running, keep it up, uh, and avoid downtime. So as you think about it, try to think about ways of you know, if somebody has an idea, run it through that sort of little test filter. Is this an idea that would change a customer experience? Is this an idea that would allow me to capture new data that I can monetize in some way? If the answer to those is no, it's not necessarily a bad idea, just scrutinize it a little bit. And if the answer to one of those is yes, you might be onto something really interesting. So people, uh, people for this stage, the most important element is the business. So uh, I'm a technologist, I'm guessing a lot of the people in the room here are technologists. We like to think we know a lot about the businesses that we work in, and in a lot of cases we do, but we don't know them as much as the people who are at the front line working with customers every day. Um, we like to call this sometimes the, the keys and locks problem. So the business has this giant pile of locks. There's all these problems that they're trying to solve. And we in IT have all of these keys. We have all this technology that could potentially be applied to solve problems. We're experts on the keys, the business is experts on the locks. Somewhere in that pile of locks and the pile of keys, there is a key that will perfectly open one of those locks. But neither group is gonna find that on their own. You have to work together, sort of educate the business on technology and what it can do, 
the business has to educate us in IT around what those key challenges are for the business and we really have to work together to develop those concepts together. Process, so how do you go about this stage? Uh, I have mode two approach written up here. Has anybody heard of bimodal IT? Approach of bimodal IT, okay. Uh, it was introduced by Gartner. Uh, basically the idea is that IT nowadays can't run at a single speed. Uh, sometimes you have to run really <coughs> slow Think of like marathon runner, uh, very, you know, the tortoise in the hare. You gotta go slow, you gotta be uh, purposeful, you can't make mistakes, you gotta follow your ITIL processes, you gotta do change management, you gotta make sure you don't break anything. That's mode one IT operation. Mode two IT operation is very agile and experimental. So you're trying to develop something new. It actually doesn't make sense to be encumbered by a lot of process and rigor. You want to learn by doing. You want to prototype things. You want to try things out. You want to fail fast. This stage of the process, it's all about mode two. You do not want to be encumbered by change management and standards and processes. You want to build something and you want to do it quickly and you don't want to spend a lot of money on it and you want to show it to the business and see what they think about it and get feedback and then make a decision about where you go from there. So it's very much a mode two uh, process. And, and again, fail fast. I mean, th these are very much like hackathon type exercises. You wanna take relatively inexpensive technology, build something and show the business what could be possible to solve a problem. So again, from a technology perspective, very quick and dirty, inexpensive devices, Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, uh, Bluetooth LED beacons, uh, Intel Galileo boards, Things that cost tens of dollars rather than thousands and tens of thousands of dollars. Um, from a back-end standpoint, this is a cloud world. I mean, you don't want to be buying technology to test these ideas. You want to be renting technology. So use things like cloud, uh, AWS, Azure. Rent your back-end for you know, hours to build this. Show it to the business, and if it wasn't a good idea, throw it away. So an example. Um, wanted to take you to, well, that couldn't be more dark. Um, that is a convenience store gas station uh, that on my laptop looks like a relatively sunny day and on here looks like it's in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, but uh, we work with um, uh, this company that operates a chain of about 250 convenience stores with, around the Northeast and we had an opportunity to work with them um, and they, the, the president of the company asked us to come in and say, you know, tell me about some of these new technologies that are out there, some IoT technologies, and if they would actually ever do anything for us in our business. Um, so that conversation actually started, so we said, great, we'd love to do that. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And the conversation started, and it had absolutely nothing to do with technology. So <coughs> our questions were, you know, what are some of the key drivers, uh, business drivers that you have going on in the business? Like, how do you measure success? What are some ways that you're trying to grow and make more money? And one of the things that they shared is um, average ticket size is the metric that they use. So basically when someone comes to the convenience store, how much money do they spend while they're there? If you only have so many number of visits in a day, um, the more people spend per visit, the more money that you'll make operating the convenience store. So we said, okay, that's great. Increase average ticket size. What are some things that you do to do that? And they walked us through some things that they do in the stores to try to do that. Uh, and then they shared a really interesting concept. They said, one thing that really can help boost average ticket size is if we can get people that show up to get gas, to pump gas, to actually come in the store and spend money in the store, that's like a massive win. And we said, okay, so you basically need to get people from here to go into there. And they said, yes, we, we, that's, that's a big thing for us. And it, it is a big thing for them. And there's actually all these really low tech ways that they try to do that today. So this is one of their gas pumps and they have signs here on the handle of the gas pump itself that says, uh, need a fresh hot cup of coffee? Um, are you feeling lucky? Come in and buy a lottery ticket. Uh, they also have signs pasted, you know, literally tapes to the pump that say, come on in and get, it, get a yogurt, things like that. So they're, they're trying to use these signs to draw people from the pump and into the store. So we, so we kept asking questions about the business, because again, at this stage, it's all about the business, the technology, is a key that's got to fit into that lock, but you got to know the lock really well before you try to pull a key. So we asked, do, do you currently know what percent of customers that pump gas actually come into the store? So that's a really important metric for you. Do you know your current performance on that metric? And they said, oh, no way. Like that, that's like impossible data to collect. I mean, 
you know, they might you know, pay with a credit card at the pump, but they might pay cash in the store, so I have no transaction record of it. There's, there's no way for me to really measure that. We said, okay, well, do you know if those signs that you put on the pumps are effective? Like, do they help? Like, if you took all the signs away with people coming in the store at the same rate, are they really, I mean, intuitively you think they're helpful, but do you know they're helpful? And if you think they're helpful, do you know which ones are actually the most effective? Because if one's more effective than others, you probably use it everywhere, right? They said, yeah, you really don't know that either. So we were sort of picking up on something that we might be able to help with with technology. So then we said, well, would you like to be able to track hard data around people? That, how many people that come and pump gas actually come into the store? Would that be meaningful if you could measure that and track that on an ongoing basis? And they're like, yes, definitely. And would it be interesting if you could actually tune the promotions that you were introducing to people at the pump based on who they are? Like if it's a coffee drinker, give them a coffee-related promotion, or if it's a ice cream person, you can give them an ice cream promotion. Would that, would that be interesting? They said yes. And then how about environment? So on days when it's cold and rainy, would it be nice to give them promotions about hot chocolate or soup? And on days when it's hot and sunny, give them promotions about lemonade and ice cream? And they said, yeah, that, that would... We don't send people out to change the pump signs every time the weather changes, but it would be good if we could do that. Um, and would you like to know which of those promotions are most effective? And the answer to all those questions was yes. And we said, all right, cool, this is helpful. Give us a few days, we're gonna work out a little something, and we'll bring it back to you in a few days to show you. Now, we don't describe it, because if you describe it, you're gonna get like the, this face. You know, people are gonna like not get what you're talking about. You need to show it. So what we did, very simple, and literally in a few days, uh, is we built a little demo where we showed them how they could use Bluetooth LED beacon technology. Is anybody familiar with Bluetooth LED beacons? I beacons? I got a slide in here, we can quickly talk about how they work, but um, to show them how that would work. So we did a little demo where we put one I beacon at the pump locations and one inside the store, uh, and the one at the pump enables detection of a customer's arrival at the pump, and the one in the store enables detection of whether that customer who was at the pump came in the store or not. Um, I think I'm going to skip this for time, but if anybody has questions after, it just describes how Bluetooth LED beacons work. If anybody has questions after, come see me, but we could spend an hour session talking about this. But so to go with the beacons, what we did is we built a really quick mobile app that did almost nothing other than listen for these beacon pings and respond to them and throw up a promotion uh, when you got within range of the gas pump beacon. Uh, and then we built a very simple back end on AWS where we aggregated these events of you know, people uh, being detected at the pump and in the store and showed them how over time they could start to track the customers that came to the pump and out of those customers that came to the pump, how many of them came to the store and what's the conversion rate on that. And you could be able to track it over time and, and tune the promotion. So, um, and, and it worked. It worked not because they stood up in class, but they got it. They understood how the technology would be applied in a way that would actually potentially help them grow the business and make more money. Because that's a company, I mean, based on the signs and everything, that's a very low-tech company. They don't spend a dollar on IT unless they can directly see how it's going to impact their bottom line. So that's just an example of when you're doing concept development, you know, make it all about the business and then bring in technology and, and selectively demonstrate it to people to show them how it works. Okay, so out of that process, hopefully you come up with a few ideas that are promising. A few that the business you know, reacts receptively to and um, is enthusiastic about. A whole bunch will not. A whole bunch will die in that first stage of the funnel, but hopefully some fall through. So now we've got a great idea. So the next step is to deploy it, right? So we want to go out and deploy it. No, absolutely not. Um, the next stage is you've got to ensure security, uh, reliability, maintainability, and the complications here are very different. Uh, now we're talking about you know all the different technologies that are involved in an IoT architecture, um, and that is a huge universe of technologies, and there are not universal standards, and it's all still evolving uh, with best practices how to do that, and you have to try to navigate all that as you go. So now the people that you need to get involved at this stage of the process, very different. Now you need IT operations. You need the people that you know, operate technology on a day-to-day -day basis. You need to integrate with the tools that they use to monitor and manage technology. You need your enterprise security group involved. You've got to really make sure that you've got this thing locked down, you know, both in terms of device security, uh, data communications, everything needs to be secure. So here, process-wise, you pivot from mode two operation to mode one. 
You've got to be very diligent. You've got to test, verify, pilot things before you do them large scale. Uh, and from a technology standpoint here, we're looking at, you know, as much as you can, you want to try to leverage an established IoT platform. You want to look at hardened edge <laughs> devices. So if you were using something like an Intel Galileo board for prototyping, now you want to look at like the Intel Edison platform for actual production deployments, things like that. Um, so just as an example, here are two, I'll call them popular, uh, reference architectures for IoT. Um, I show two for an example uh, to demonstrate the fact that they are not identical. Uh, and you could probably, this is two, I could probably come up with half a dozen that are all going to have similar elements, that they're all going to be slightly different. Um, but the, the one on the left here is from a company called WSO2 on the West Coast. They do a lot of middleware stuff for applications and um, IoT as well. And the one on the right is Gartner. Uh, so to just walk through one of them, uh, you basically, you've got a device layer, you've got a communication layer, there's always some event processing uh, message bus layer, then, uh, sorry, uh, an aggregation message bus layer, then an event processing layer where you're also aggregating that data for analytics, then there's an access layer where you're able to both access the data um, from an operational standpoint around events and also analytic uh, from a BI perspective, and then on the right, there's a management layer, so you have to be able to manage the devices, um, ensure device security when a device talks to another device, how do you ensure that that device is who they say they are, things like that. Uh, Gardner has similar elements in their architecture, but it's a little different. They define an IoT endpoint layer. The endpoint includes both the thing and the sensor. There's communication back to a platform, sometimes goes through a gateway or not. Um, there's a device management layer, there's an API for integration with you know, legacy enterprise IT applications. So the point here is there's lots of technology decisions. It's not one, it's not two, it's not six. There's dozens of technology decisions that you need to make at each one of these layers before you actually deploy one of these types of projects out into the wild. And just to underscore that point, if you Google IoT technology landscape, you get this. So, how many logos are on the screen? I, mean, I don't even know. But at the bottom, you know, these are all the building blocks. So these are the different connection protocols, the different hardware devices. At the top, it's some of the platforms, the horizontal platforms from companies like ThingWorks. Uh, it's a PTC company. They have an IoT platform, uh, the GE Predix platform. Uh, and then in the middle, you've got a lot of verticals. So if you're in a vertical industry, there's a lot of vertical IoT platforms out there that are tailored to try to handle the specific challenges for the industry. So you definitely need to look at those. Um, just from an IoT platform perspective, I'll tell you there's a great Gartner paper, if anyone's a Gartner subscriber, uh, it's, a, it's the Market Guide to IoT Platforms, written by an analyst named <laughs> Al Velosa. Um, it talks about the different, uh, some of the leading IoT platforms on the market. There's 16 IoT platforms in that paper, and that's just a subset. So there's lots of homework to do here, very technical, lots of, lots of things for you to work through. Okay, <laughs> presuming you get through there, right? You have a great idea, a winning concept. Now you're looking for a way to harden and operationalize that and deploy it uh, in a secure, reliable um, fashion. You're done, right? No. Now your challenge is you gotta deploy that at scale. Now, one of the unique things about IoT projects is they go really, really wide at the edge. So it's not like something where I need to walk in my data center and deploy my IoT application. IoT is way out there at the edge of the organization and for big uh, companies, this is often hundreds of locations where devices need to get installed. So you have the challenge now of trying to deploy this in dealing with lots of people in lots of places working with lots of things. And the other thing is you're gonna be under a lot of pressure to get it deployed as soon as possible because you worked with the business to come up with a really cool concept that they were excited about and then you spent a whole bunch of time working on security and they're chomping at the bit to get it implemented so by the time you get to this point, they're gonna to wanna to get it done fast. So critical success factors at this stage of the game, it's all about speed and scale. Um, you gotta have very often a wide geographic reach uh, but you have to do it with controls. So everybody's probably heard the saying, you know, measure twice, cut once. This is a situation where you're gonna measure twice and probably cut thousands of times in hundreds of different locations. So you need to not only measure twice, you probably need to measure three times and you need to monitor those cuts, those first sets of cuts as they're happening to make sure that they're done the right way. 
Um, so there's lots, just a different kind of problem. Now this is a scale execution problem. So the people that you get involved here can be very different. Do you have the internal capability to do this? I'm sure you have smart engineers and admins in your organization that would be capable of doing it, but if you have to deploy a solution, for example, in a retail environment to 500 stores, the business isn't gonna be patient while you send one team out to serially do one store at a time. So you very often need to parallelize this and get multiple teams out going at the same time to get this done as quickly as possible. Lots of companies look to an integration partner to help with this stage of the process. From a process standpoint, uh, you really need integrated end-to-end -end capability around delivery. And I've got a slide in a second to share um, some of the ways that we do this. Um, and the technology here isn't about the technology that you're implementing so much anymore. It's about the technology that you're using to control that implementation process. So you're doing things at scale now. You're going to be doing the same kinds of things, uh, installing configurations, updating device code levels hundreds and thousands of times, you want to update, you want to automate that as much as you possibly can, and you want to have really good controls to make sure that everything got set up the way that it was supposed to, so that you don't have problems out in the wild that you have to deal with. So the end-to-end -end capability. Um, design, you got to come up with the design at a high level, but then at a low level, a detailed bill of materials that you can order from. Sourcing, purchasing that equipment, managing all the material when it comes in, uh, the staging and configuration process, you want to centralize that as much as we can. Um, doing all of that work centrally gives you the ability to automate it, monitor it, uh, have your best and brightest people overseeing it as it's happening. Then logistics, you got to ship all of that equipment all the way out to the edge wherever it lives. you got to have technical services out there to do whatever installation and implementation work that has to happen at the edge. And you got to have really good service validation to make sure that the people who did those jobs way out of your normal line of sight actually did what you asked them to do, what they were supposed to do. In order to make this all work, you need really good people, process, technology, and facilities to support it, things like staging and configuration, technology to automate, um, really good mature processes, and then people coverage, whether it's a, if it's a US project, do you have people that can cover the whole country? Uh, if it's a global project, people that can cover the whole world. So just a few examples of this. Um, um, customers that we've worked with to deploy these types of technologies at scale at the edge. Uh, NYPD, we help them implement AVL devices, basically GPS trackers in 5,000 of their police cruisers uh, and integrate it with the central main console in the car so that a central dispatcher can have automatic location updates of where the cruisers are at any point in time in the city. Um, the digital dressing rooms, we're actually working with one of our customers now, a specialty retailer with about 400 stores across um, the US and Canada to implement that digital dressing room technology. Um, RFID readers, uh, displays, you got to run cabling to that so that it can have connectivity. Now there's lots of pieces around doing that. And the bottom is uh, one of my favorites. If anybody's been to Disney World within the last three or four years, you might be familiar, yeah, with this magic band technology. 